Good morning. I'm sure everyone's uh, bright and shiny. Um, last night, um, Thomas Gleichner took me out, or you know, we went out, and I think I came back around 2 a.m. or whatever, and I think he did that so he'd think if he got me drunk enough that it would make me speak slower. <laughs> Good luck with that. <clears throat> anyway, my name's Steve Rosted. Um, I work for Red Hat. I'm on the real-time team there. I've uh, been working with uh, Thomas and Ingo Monar from 2004 with the uh, real-time patch. Um, I'm right now the, currently the uh, maintainer of the uh, stable releases um, uh, <clears throat> that you can see. It's from you know 3.2 RT, 3.4 RT, which I found out um, Lee Sefan um, on Monday or Tuesday or whatever. Uh, the RT summit was, I mentioned that 3.4 uh, is no longer going to be supported, but then later that day, Lee Safan sent 3.4 patches out. So I'm like, oh, what's going on here? It says it's going to be end of life in September. Um, so I sent him an email and he said he's going to do two more releases, approximately two. That could mean 10. Um, so I probably will continue supporting 3.4 or 4, three, four for a while. I also support, let's see, uh, uh, 3.10, 3.12, I think 3.14, I guess, is done, finally. Um, 3.18, I'm still supporting. Um, 4.1 and 4.4. 4.6 uh, four, is end of life now. Uh, development has moved to 4.8. Um, and when 4.9 comes out, if that turns out to be the long-term stable, they're going to develop on that. And, when, and that's going to be what I'll support later, so I'm not going to support anything uh, from 4.4 up until probably 4.9, if that becomes a long-term stable. Uh, anyway, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about a uh, sketch deadline. Uh, so, does this work? Help if I turn it on. There. So, first of all, what is sketch deadline? Uh, I'm sure a lot of here, people here know what it is, and maybe a lot of people here don't know what it is, and I think maybe that's why you came here to see what sketch deadline is. Um, one thing is, since you guys always take pictures of me, I have to take pictures of you. There. Um, so, there's other scheduling classes out there. When you first uh, boot up your, or when you boot up your computer and you start your tasks and run your tasks, uh, the default is sched other. That goes under the uh, completely fair scheduler, and um, <clears throat> it basically tries to do um, the CPU time slices for each task to be as fair as it can. So. Um, it's, you know, you keep a bunch of tasks. Uh, a lot of times, the ones that are like most interactive are usually the ones that hopefully uh, gets the best or quickest time frame. So uh, you have a smooth desktop experience. Um, but then there's other um, scheduling classes out there. There's Sched FIFO and Sched RR. Uh, Sched FIFO first in first out is just that. It's um, the first task to come in at a certain priority will run until it gives up the CPU. Um, or another higher priority process comes in that will preempt it and it will continue. Uh, there's um, a bandwidth, or RT bandwidth schedule, it's been out there for, I forgot which one it came in, but it's been out there for a while. If you look into slash proc slash sys slash kernel slash, you'll see sked underscore RT underscore runtime and sked underscore RT underscore period. Um, that's actually kind of like a sked deadline type of schedule. It's a bandwidth scheduler that keeps real time tasks running at most like 95% of the CPU. So for 950 um, milliseconds, uh, a real-time task could go into an infinite loop, but after it hits that, it will be throttled, and you'll get a message in your console saying it's been throttled. And the reason why we do that is because if a real-time task were to go into an infinite loop because of a bug, it would lock up that CPU, and bad things usually happen. So a lot of bug reports said, hey, I got some task that's where my system locked up, and we find out that some bug in user space was using a real-time task and went on forever, so we had a throttle, so we added code to throttle those tasks so your system could still be responsive with only 5% of the CPU. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to talk about uh, the constant bandwidth scheduler and the deadline a little bit later, but let me continue. Um, your processes in SCEDOther are modified by a nice variable. Everyone here knows Unix, and you have that nice command. And the nicer you are, the basically more CPU you give up. Um, so the higher nice value, actually, the lower priority you are. Um, and that's, that's, you could use that to, if you have a batch job, you want to give it a really high nice, because you don't really care about the speed. But if you have something that's interactive, you want that to have a higher priority. Um, Sked FIFO, I mentioned, is the first in, first out. And finally, there's Sked RR, which is Sked Round Robin. And I don't know why we even have Sked RR. It's a POSIX 
uh, scheduler, so uh, it's out there because of POSIX reasons, but I don't know anyone that actually uses it. I, don't, I can't even give you a reason to use SCEDRR. Um, I kind of find it's a weird scheduler because it's, uh, when you run at a priority, if a, another task of the same priority schedules, it eventually will run as well. But you really have no control over when that happens. So it's just basically uh, the CPU is going to give two tasks, three tasks, four tasks. Time slices are the CPU, and there's really the, it's up to the kernel on how it does that, um, which makes it really non-deterministic, which is the whole point that real time is supposed to be. It's supposed to be deterministic, and that's why I never understood the concept of SCEDRR. I avoid it. I tell people why I use it, because uh, it's confusing. And not only that, SCEDRR has a little issue with scheduling on uh, multiprocessors. If you have two CPUs and you schedule three SCEDRR tasks, two of them will be, if two of them get loaded on one CPU, they'll run 50, each one will get 50% of the CPU, the other one will get 100% of the CPU, and there's nothing there to migrate them. So that's one of the issues with SCEDRR. And I really, no one's complained about it, it's been like this for years, so I don't think we're ever going to bother fixing that. So <clears throat> let me come up with a little scenario. Uh, the start introduced to with like, you know, bandwidth schedulers and all that. You have two programs and running at a nuclear power plant. And the, the power plant are, you know, they're cutting costs, they're really cheap, and they give one machine with one CPU on it to run the control system, the safety system of the nuclear power plant. And on that same processor, they have a washing machine attached to it. And that processor is going to run the washing machine as well um, to save costs. So the nuclear power plant needs half a second every second in order to make sure all the safety things are going on and everything's fine. So 500 milliseconds out of every 1,000 milliseconds. The washing machine needs 50 milliseconds every 200 milliseconds uh, on that same machine. Who gets the higher priority? Well, OK, who thinks the power plant does? <laughs> OK, you know this is a trick question. <laughs> you just know it's not the power plant, because that's the obvious answer. Right, so we have our power plant, and we have our washing machine. Uh, the power plant, like I said, takes 500 milliseconds and every second, and the um, <clears throat> washing machine, like 20 milliseconds every, what? I forgot what it said, what I say, 200 milliseconds, or 50 milliseconds every 200 milliseconds. So you got all these chopping going around. That's what it would look like if they had the CPU by themselves. But if you gave the priority to the washing machine, so the nuke is higher priority than the um, uh, washing machine, <clears throat> where you'll see the red, uh, the, the washing machine can't run. So it's, going, it's definitely going to miss its deadline, because it has a 200 millisecond deadline, the washing machine is going to run, for, or the nuclear power plant is going to run for 500 milliseconds. So it's guaranteed the crash as soon as you turn it on. And what happens here is <coughs> your nuclear power plant's moving fine, but all the employees are trying to wash their clothes because they're, they're glowing green uh, from working in there. And the machine keeps breaking down, and now there's a huge line, and everyone's trying to wash his clothes because the they're afraid of their own health. No one's watching the uh, nuclear power plant anymore, and the system blows up. That's why the entire system matters. So now let's if we swap the priorities, and we have the washing machine higher priority than the uh, nuclear power plant. <clears throat> the nuclear power plant can be split up. That, that if you notice back there, if you look at it, the, it shrunk and it's a little bit. I, I actually made this. Um, I actually measured it, so the size actually moved. The nuclear power plant can easily make its deadline, and the washing machine can easily make its deadline. And what this is called is Rate Monotonic Scheduling, RMS. <laughs> and that helps you prevent any stall. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so you have computational time versus a period. So computational time is like how much execution time you need for the process. Uh, it can be implemented with SCED FIFO. Um, the smallest period gets the highest priority, as we just mentioned. Uh, so if you 
figure out the little uh, mathematical formulas. It's the sum of all the computational times, like I said, the uh, 200 milli or I say 500 milliseconds over 1,000, plus the washing machine that had 20 over 200 or whatever. Uh, that's the, f the formula. Is the sum of the utilization of the CPU is the sum of all your tasks with the computational time over the period. Okay, so <clears throat> let's throw um, a dishwasher into the mix. Yeah, they're really cutting costs now. So we're doing the dishwasher onto the same machine because we say, hey, we have a lot more um, uh, utilization left on this CPU. Let's utilize it. And now we have the nuclear power plant. I kept the nuclear power plant the same, 500 out of 1,000. The washing machine actually went up to 100 milliseconds out of, eight, ever, out of 800 milliseconds. And you have your dishwasher at 300 milliseconds out of every 900 milliseconds. And because the uh, washing machine has the shortest deadline or shortest period, you give it the highest priority, the uh, dishwasher will get the next priority, and the nuclear power plant's sitting there way back at the end. <clears throat> so we start off, and the first tick um, you'll see is the washing machine that needs you know, 100, uh, 100 milliseconds. So this is 100 milliseconds, each number. So the first is 100 milliseconds, the washing machine goes off. And it finishes its execution, so it throttles. It says, OK, I'm done. And it um, gives up the CPU and goes to sleep. And giving um, the next task up, it's going to be the dishwasher that has 300 milliseconds every 900 milliseconds. So it could still make its deadline. It's only at 400 milliseconds right now. And then finally, the slowest thing, the nuclear power plant comes, and it's chugging along. It needs 500 milliseconds every 1,000 milliseconds. And it hits eight at the 800 millisecond point. The uh, washing machine wakes up. And it runs, preempting the nuclear power plant. And then we're at the 900 milliseconds period where the dishwasher's turn comes in. It starts running. It chugs along, boom, boom, boom. And finally, the nuclear power plant runs. Well, look, look, that's at 1,200 milliseconds. So it failed. It crashed. But how could this happen? There's, um, if you look at this, we had only 95% of the utilization. So going back to the slide, um, <clears throat> we find out that we do our calculations. You know, we come up, oh, see here? It was, yeah. Uh, the calculations come up to be, um, there's a lot of papers out there. I have links that have some of the stuff I looked up and read. I've read this stuff back in 2001 um, to two. So this has been out for a while for a rate monotonic scheduling. Um, the utilization is, comes down to where you could guarantee in any situation to always be able to make your deadlines, comes down to that little formula right there. Whereas the utilization can be no more than n tasks, so n is the number of tasks, and it'll be 2 to the root of n <coughs> minus 1. <clears throat> so back with the 500 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds, and 100 milliseconds, and we do the calculations for the utilizations. So we plug that in. We add them up. We come up to point, about 95% utilization of the CPU. <clears throat> well, we plug in the calculation of the same thing for three tasks. For three tasks, the best that rate monotonic scheduling can give you is just under 78% of the CPU. So we easily went over what rate monotonic uh, is guaranteed to give us. And you saw how easily that blew up. So if you really like doing math and, and limits and all that, you can run uh, the limit calculation. Um, and if you go from n goes to infinity, uh, this calculation turns into uh, the natural log of 2, which is uh, just a little over six, uh, 69%. So rate monotonic is guaranteed to give any scenario 69% uh, of the CPU utilization. Which brings us to SCED deadline. It's not a rate monotonic system. It's a um, uh, constant bandwidth scheduler uh, with um, earliest deadline first um, implemented on it, which gives us a dynamic priority. And what that is, is every time uh, at every tick or whatever scheduling event, it looks who has the next deadline, which deadline's coming up next. That gets the highest priority. So if we go back and implement the exact same thing that we just did with the three, you know, the dishwasher, the uh, washing machine, and the uh, nuclear power plant, you know, the washing machine starts off because it's got the next, the next priority is the, our uh, next deadline is the washing machine is at 800 milliseconds. So it runs, runs for its one. Then the dishwasher comes up, it's, it's next because it's at the 900 millisecond period. 
So it runs. Then we're back with the nuclear power plant, boom, 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 boom. And then we get back to the 800 millisecond where the period of the uh, uh, washing machine is now started. But instead of running the washing machine, the next deadline is the nuclear power plant, which is at 10. Um, the washing machine started its next period, and that's actually 16, or you know, 1,600 milliseconds later. And the, um, even at this point, uh, the dishwasher is at uh, 1,800 um, milliseconds. So, it's, so 10 is still the highest priority, and we're all happy. So it could run, run, and continues. So SCED deadline, we implemented two new system calls <coughs> in there. Uh, because what was existing there before for changing your priorities um, didn't include deadlines and run times and periods. So we created a SCED get adder. Um, and the flags is there to help for future enhancements to the scheduler. Um, and, that's, and we also pass in the size. So it's similar to kind of like, we kind of uh, base this after like Unix socket, socket or the socket system call or whatever, or, or binding all the Unix where you pass in the size of the structure so you can make sure everything you're doing is correct. So the attribute, the struct get attribute can change in the future. And <clears throat> the kernel will be always backwards compatible. But if you want to know if your kernel supports a new feature that is added, you may have to add something new. And then the, the system call will tell you whether or not it's um, available on the kernel. Uh, the SCED adder looks like this, which is um, where we have you know, the size of the structure. OK, so make sure that this is the correct size that we're actually pulling in. And then your policy, that's the SCED other. So you can actually use this to change yourself back to do SCED FIFO or SCED, um, SCED other or SCED RR. Uh, <clears throat> even that's why it has the nice there, because if you're SCED other, you could, you could change your nice value using this call. And then the other fields will just be ignored. Uh, SCED priority, again, is for SCED FIFO and SCED RR. But then we have the three new uh, fields, runtime, deadline, and period. That's for SCED deadline. Uh, so when you run, write your code, you know, you do your, you create, what I, tell, I always do is when I write a SCED deadline task or fun function, I always get the information uh, what the task query was. So I usually use SCED get adder just so I don't have to figure out what this task is. Just give me what the status is right now, and I'm going to make the changes of what I want and then write it back. The fields, the runtime and deadline and period are in um, nanoseconds. Uh, so everything is relative nanoseconds. Uh, so if you do it, although, Here's a little thing that you have to know. It's not in the slides. I'll let you guys know. So those that are either watching the video or you guys will be knowing about this. But those that just look at the slides, tough. Um, I guess I can't exact the exact uh, level. But if you're doing anything more than a millisecond um, periods, like if you're going to the nanoseconds, you need to make sure that you have HR tick, SCED HR tick enabled. And that's in the slash debug slash SCED or debug or was it um, sys? I believe it's in sys kernel, debug, uh, SCED features. If you look in there, you'll see HR tick, uh, SCED HR tick, or whether it's set. Uh, look at that. Make sure it's enabled. Uh, turn that on. Otherwise, um, everything is going to be, the resolution is going to be like uh, in milliseconds. So if you want something better than milliseconds, you have to make sure HR uh, high resolution timers are enabled for the scheduler. I mean, high resolution timers may be scheduled for your kernel, but if it's not enabled for the scheduler, uh, you're not going to get uh, the benefit from it. So SCED yield. Um, I always love this. Uh, I've seen this used a lot in the past. I don't see it used as much. SCED yield actually used to be in the kernel and uh, used quite all over the place. And one thing those real-time folks did was get rid of them all. In fact, we went through and got rid of all SCED yield calls within the kernel and removed that call. So SCED yield can only be called by a system call now uh, from user space. We still get let user space shoot themselves in the foot, but we don't want the kernel doing that. Uh, SCED yield, almost every single time I've seen SCED yield used, it was because of buggy code. I seldom ever saw it actually used properly for what it was actually made for. Uh, for SCED other, it's another way of being nicer if you want. Because if you call SCED, like you'd be running, you could call SCED yield just in case that you, know, you want something else, give up my time slice for now and give it to someone else. And it, and it does work for that. So if you're on SCED uh, uh, running a, some function or some program and you don't want this guy to be taking up all the CPU and batch jobs, call SCED yield, that's fine. But nice works just as well. 
it's kind of obsolete in that use case. Uh, SCED FIFO um, and SCED RR can use it, and the only proper time to use SCED yield is when you have the exact or multiple processes running at the exact same priority. So if you want to implement your own volunteer scheduler, uh, you create everything at SCED FIFO, um, do everything at SCED FIFO a priority, and when you're running and you're saying, okay, I want to let one of my other tasks run, you do SCED yield, and that will guarantee that another guy will run that's on the run queue, and it just pushes you behind everyone in that FIFO. So it basically, since it's first in, first out, it takes you out and then puts you in the back of the queue, and then you run again. But it only works if it's the same priority. And what we used to see was something like this. Like, <clears throat> sometimes they're like a try lock type of situation, where you have a lock where you want to keep the lock order, you know, lock, grabbing lock A and grabbing lock B. But let's say um, the lock order, because I have like here, grabbing the F. So basically, let's say that you, the normal lock order of your program, you have to grab B before you grab A. But for some reason, you grabbed A first and had to do some work. And then you grab, had it grab B in the reverse order. But if you just take that lock, you could cause a deadlock because someplace else might have done it, it might, might already have B waiting on A. So if most of your programs has B, waits on A, you don't want to grab A, then grab B. So what you might do is release B and then um, go back and try again. But I've seen people actually implement this, and they did this. This is a code, actually, this is actually a real type of code that was done once I caught. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me because they're wondering why their system wasn't working. And what happened was <coughs> they had a, a multiple tasks with different priorities. And B was held by a low priority task. And then what higher priority task went up and called this code and did the A, B, you know, release A, you know, sched yield, which just rescheduled itself and then went through the loop again. So sched yield did nothing because the task it was actually waiting for was of a lower priority. But for SCED deadline, we actually have a new use for it. It's good. You use SCED yield properly. Because SCED yield is the way you tell the kernel, I'm done with my execution unit. So if you're running, if, you're, if you have a task to do every period, and you're given maybe, like, say, 500 milliseconds every 1,000 milliseconds, and you finish it in 200 milliseconds, and you want to tell the kernel, I'm done, give up, you call SCED yield. And then the kernel will actually just flush out the rest of your time, say okay, and then you'll wake up at the next period. Um, I have a, um, I sh forgot to put the link up here. Uh, if you look on, um, I believe in GitHub, but also if you uh, go onto the kernel.org RT tests, I'll, I'll have to post the tags or send me an email if you're interested in this. Uh, inside the RT test where cyclic tests lives, uh, there's another program that I wrote called um, cyclic deadline that implement cyclic tests. Now, cyclic tests is a way that we used to test the jitter of real-time tasks, where we would have a timer go off uh, periodically, and when it woke up, we looked at a timestamp and says, okay, what's the timestamp now, and what's the timestamp I expect to wake up at and measure that, and then it would record um, <clears throat> the jitter, or how, how much off that was, and give you the max, the min, the average. Um, so, cyclic deadline does almost the same thing, except for doing like the nano sleep that um, a sched, a cyclic test does, it does a sched yield. So it sets up a period to the time it wants, and then as it's running, it just wakes when it, it just says, check the timestamp, okay, what do I expect it to be? And then measure it, and then sched yield. Check the timestamp, it it's just a loop of doing that. And um, <clears throat> that's how it's testing the sched line scheduler, because it's not, say, it's not saying, I want to sleep for this long. It just it told this kernel, this is where my period wants to be, and this is why I want to be woken up. And then it just does get yield, and the kernel does the rest. My favorite machine, the donut hole puncher. Think of a conveyor belt going down with donuts that were made with no holes in it. So you have your donut hole puncher punching around, and it's all measured properly. So now we have a period and we have a um, time slice that we have to, uh, a deadline. But the period and the deadline aren't the same. Because as soon as I run, I have a short time to make that puncher shoot down. Otherwise, I have lopsided holes. And we don't want lopsided holes in our donuts. Especially if it's off to the side, you'll look at it and say, who took, who took a bite out of my donut? So 
This is something else we don't always have. We have, um, uh, can't have offset holes, obviously. So you can actually go in and put in runtime is less than or equal to your deadline, which is less than or equal to your period. Um, and <clears throat> when you do the calculation again, uh, even though your period may be longer and you might have a lot of utilization, to, for the true, uh, just for your calculations, for true utilization that's guaranteed, it's the deadline that matters. Even though the deadline, between the deadline and the period, there might be opening up. But if you have two tasks waking up at the exact same time, and they both have like the same deadline, even though they both are sharing a lot of, like you know, say, there's a lot of leftover utilization of the CPU because it's a small task. Um, if they share the same deadline and they have close to the same runtime unit and that's more than uh, one utilization, they're both going to fail, one of them is going to fail their um, deadline. So <clears throat> when you do your calculations, deadline matters, not the period. But a lot of cases, period and deadline are the same, which makes things easier. SMP, multiprocessors. The arc nemesis of real time. Uh, it screws up everything. In fact, a lot of times we always say we want to get, you know, if we had our way, the real time folks, we would get rid of 32 bit. Uh, we would get rid of multiprocessors. We would get rid of modules. <laughs> but people want these, and we curse them. So, Dahl's effect for uh, multiprocessors. Let's say you have M CPUs, and you have M plus one tasks. <clears throat> one of those tasks have a runtime of 999 milliseconds of every 1,000 milliseconds. Um, and by the way, if you look in the papers, usually they make the runtime, period, and deadline all the same. So technically, in the pap paper, it would be 1,000. But I'm like, come on, no one ever would make their runtime exactly the same as their period because, you know, you have schedule overheads and interrupt hands on handling. So I'm like, let's make it a little bit more realistic, a tiny bit more. So let's just say 999 milliseconds out of every 1,000 milliseconds. Then you have M tasks. So if you have five CPUs, you have five tasks uh, that have only 10 milliseconds out of 999 milliseconds. So a slightly shorter um, deadline. They all start at the same time. So when you implement this, and if all the tasks have the exact same, or those M tasks have the exact same period, they're going to all run. Now, if you have a good uh, um, scheduler, and they put them on all CPUs, so since they all, these M tasks are going to be running on M CPUs because they have the shortest deadline, the 999, so they're going to run for 10 mil, uh, milliseconds. Well, that M plus one task needs only could give up one millisecond in that uh, case. So you are guaranteed for that task to fail its deadline. Um, <clears throat> so this is where things get tricky when you uh, use uh, earliest deadline first with multiprocessors. Because EDF cannot guarantee on all situations anything better than a utilization of one. Usually you would say, if you have two CPUs, that would be a utilization of two, which would be 100% of two CPUs. So EDF can only guarantee a utilization of one no matter how many processes you throw at it. So there is limits you can throw into the equation to make it pass the, uh, give it more than a one utilization. So it's not, it's not going to, um, we can't say multiprocessors are useless because you can achieve better than one utilization if you restrict um, the domain of your, um, the, what's it called, the computation versus period. And we have two things you could do. One is partitioning, and one is global. Partitioning is where you say, okay, I'm going to bind uh, my tasks to each CPU, and that way, if you bind everything to one CPU, you achieve a utilization of one, and then on, uh, you bind something to a second CPU, you could achieve up to a utilization of one. So right there, you have a utilization of two doing, um, uh, what's it called, EDF. Now, the problem is, uh, for all situations, you could come up with something where that will not work. So the whole idea that EDF cannot do better than one means that it can't do better than one in any situation. But there are situations where EDF can't do full 
use up all the CPUs. That's as if you could break it up, partition it, if you can. Uh, global lets you say, okay, I want to just let the CPU or let the kernel migrate these guys anywhere you go. But for all situations, one is the highest you could achieve. Sometimes you can't use EDF partitioned um, because there's no way you could combinate everything to give you a full one on one CPU. You have to break it. You have to ha have migration. Although this above that, those utilization, that would be a trick to get that working. <laughs> Even though it's only, um, what's it called? It's 1.6 utilization. That would be a really tough case to get working uh, with EDF. But if you want to figure out how to partition things using multiple CPUs, saying, okay, this group is going to have CPUs one through three, these CPUs are going to have uh, or use utilization of you know, uh, two through six, another one's going to use all the CPUs, this becomes the uh, bin packing problem. Uh, everyone remembers your uh, uh, computer science courses and you did NP complete problems, the bin packing, right? How do you pack like a truck and all that stuff? Uh, same algorithm, and it's NP complete. It's impossible to solve it. So um, in, a, in our lifetime, basically, if you threw in like 80 CPUs, there's no way you're going to figure out the best calculations to figure things out. So uh, EDF can't really, partitioning makes it is very uh, difficult if you do that, if you want to get the most optimal way of uh, achieving your utilization. So we have, uh, looking at global um, EDF, which is what we implement inside the kernel, as I said, it can't guarantee utilization of one for all cases, but for special cases, we can. And the point is, if you have, let's just start saying, if your deadline and your period are identical, and I'm not going to play the whole trick there, so you have a deadline and period are identical, so you have execution time. Uh, the utilization is the percentage of a task. So the, um, if you take all the utilizations of each task, so like I said, if, you have, um, if you're using 100 milliseconds out of every 1,000 milliseconds, that's a utilization of 10% you know, or 0.1. Um, and you look at it and you find the max utilization there. The utilization that you could get to guarantee is, um, can be up to the number of CPUs minus the number of CPUs minus one times that uh, max. So let's say if we have eight CPUs and a utilization of one of our max utilization is like that nuclear power plant that takes 50% of the um, <coughs> CPU. We run it through the calculation, you know, of eight minus seven times 0.5, and we could achieve a max utilization of 4.5, which is much better than one. But it's not eight. You have eight CPUs, you should have a utilization of eight. But we could do better than half the utilization if we limit our um, uh, deadlines. So when you, this is where I start um, my rant on the current um, state of SCED deadline in Linux. <sighs> when you started off, the first thing, we default to running on every CPU. We don't do partitioning. You can't do partitioning, it's difficult. Uh, and that's going to hurt using utilization of SCED deadline. We're working on it. I'm talking to Peter Zilstra. Um, we're coming up with ideas uh, to go because he said, doing partitioning, we always have to guarantee that uh, the kernel, when you we still guarantee that the bandwidth, the utilization is there, that you can succeed your uh, deadlines or from the utilization you give us. Uh, those mathematical formulas are used in the kernel to make sure the guarantee is there. And the problem with um, uh, doing any affinity, the SCED deadline tasks, you can't change the affinity. It, the affinity uh, is always going to be all CPUs of the SCED domain. And <coughs> We do that because to be able to change affinities arbitrarily would be that bin packing problem inside, and we don't want to do that inside the kernel. You know, running an NP complete algorithm um, is not something that people would like. And that would probably cause your deadlines to miss your deadlines anyway. There's no forking of children or for other deadline tasks. You don't fork, can't have children, your deadline tasks are fixed. Um, that, because that opens up a whole new can of worms. In the future, we may allow it if we have a good use case for it. Uh, right now, we just say no. If you want a SCED deadline task and you want it to fork something, basically whatever's running can't be a deadline. It's got to do the thread. You've got to clone, fork, or clone. And then after you do that, then you've got to set SCED deadline. You can't just do it right away and then fork. That wasn't work. We are thinking of if you do it, it would just lose its, it will just 
lose its deadline priority. So one answer is if you allow a get deadline task to fork, that task, because that changes a whole, adds a whole new utilization, it just drops it to get other. That's one of the uh, options we're looking at. And another thing is sked deadline, you could say this is how much run CPU time I want. So that, ge that means that the CPU is guarantee or the kernel is guaranteeing you uh, bandwidth, that's the bandwidth, that's the bandwidth scheduler, that you'll get that utilization. The problem is on today's hardware, figuring out what that worst case execution time is, is extremely difficult. And sometimes when you find it, it's so much greater than the average. I mean, there's been times where I get, I've done calculations of, or prime number calculations. That's what I do in my tests. I usually do prime number calculations for deadline to see how long it gets and measure it. And sometimes like, I figure out, OK, I want to measure how many loops do I get? How many primes do I get to do, to do satisfy uh, one millisecond or even one second? And then after I got that calculation, I run it again, and the time shoots to half or a quarter. So you're fluctuating, that means my worst case scenario, I'd have to say, okay, it really only needs, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, you know, 250 milliseconds, but there's always those outliers that could be over, a, like, you know, a second. And that means what am I do? Am I going to have to make my deadline that one second? So it's very difficult to calculate, get your application to use it just because today's hardware is so crazy. As I said, you can't do affinity, uh, but you could create new SCED domains. If you want to do partitioning, which makes it a lot easier, if you could you know, partition and make sure that these tasks are running on this CPU and these tasks are running on this CPU, you can do that today. Um, it just takes a little work. You have to go to CPU sets. You create your own set. You create another set. You uh, put all your CPUs. Um, that you want to use, or let's say you put your CPU that you want to use, that's actually number three, into your set and all the other CPUs, like for this is for four CPUs, I go zero to two, go into um, the other set, and then you have to set the mems, um, uh, memory, that's like for memory, uh, uh, what CPU sets, um, then there's load balancing you got to turn on, you make it CPU exclusive, you do that for both, and then on top, at the top layer, you turn off load balancing there, and now you got two CPU uh, SCED domains working. Uh, one SCED domain is going to be from zero to zero, one, and two, another SCED domain is just three. Now I could place a SCED deadline task into that, um, into my, uh, uh, my set, so now that task is now bound to CPU three. And you gotta make sure you push all the other tasks off that CPU if you want. Uh, so it's not pretty, it's not nice. Uh, this is one of the things that's going to hurt utilization of SCED deadline in Linux today is the fact that it's, it's kind of a pain. Uh, I've implemented this all in C. I have, uh, if you go, if you wanna look at and play around with this stuff and you wanna do it, uh, find that SCED deadline or it's called deadline test and also uh, cyclic deadline. I implement this in C and do all the work so you can partition. And it's not pretty, it's not nice. I've already mentioned this uh, about uh, it's hard to calculate um, worst case execution time. But there's a new there's a set of patches out there that we're working on. Let's see if I have it on my next slide. Yes. Grub. No, this is not a bootloader. <laughs> It's greedy reclaim of unused bandwidth. <laughs> Unfortunate name. So now when you hear Grub, you gotta say, wait, <laughs> what are you? I got Grub on the embedded device. Really? We use Umbu. Um, so what it basically does is allows for unreclaimed, uh, basically if you call sked yield and you give up your CPU, that will be passed off to the other tasks that are using it. So now, uh, it, the utilization, you can put up the utilization of high and only use this part of it, and other t tasks will, when on a need, basically almost on, as a need for basis, uh, be able to use it. There's a few other algorithms out there that use this, but the whole point is let tasks uh, get by, uh, even though they don't, if they have that one outlier, and you only gave it so much, um, uh, percentage 
your execution time. Because right now, if you, um, if you have that outlier, the CPU, once you run up and you've filled up your execution time, the CPU will throttle you, and then you go off and you wait, and then you start again. And now you just, you didn't finish your task because you had some CPU problem where um, it took a little longer than you gave it. Now it will, it will say, oh, do we have utilization still available? It will let you go beyond your utilization. And this actually works quite nicely. Uh, it's not in the kernel yet. Um, patches are going out. Uh, so expect it probably maybe, hopefully, 4.10 will have it, if not 4.11. Too bad 4.9, if that's a long-term release, it's not going to have it, but maybe we'll backport it. Who knows? Someone might. Here's a bunch of links. Top one, uh, it's right in the kernel. Uh, documentation, scheduler, sched deadline.txt, a lot of the stuff I talk about is in there. Uh, these are the papers I read before um, uh, giving this talk. Uh, the, uh, a lot of good information out there. The Anderson papers at the bottom, there's a lot of really nice, if you go to the Anderson link, there's a lot of nice uh, papers about real time. Um, you could be there all day, all week, all month reading them. So I got just under nine minutes left, and I guess it's question time. I won't. No questions? Oh, this one. Should we have a microphone or something? Or just scream? And I'll try to repeat. Oh, so, so the question is, if you actually try to violate the, uh, uh, the constraints, but you send it to the, to you, you basically, you do, that, do the set attribute, and you're violating the CPU, the set attribute will fail. It's, 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 it's linked. I mean, it's, 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 there's locks in there. You, it's serialized. You can't just have, like, all these processes. Oh, once you set up the sched attribute, you forget it. It's only done at once. Once you start, um, once you start sched deadline, you give it the attributes of what you need, and then the scheduler goes on from there. So the bandwidth is set up. You don't have to do it, like, every period or something. Well, yes. If the third, the, if the last guy, if the last process tries to set itself up and it's going to fail the mathematical constraints, that last process, that sched set, the set attribute where it tries to set itself will fail. Yeah, that's the whole point. Yes. Okay. So basically, it's just because one of them. Yep. Um, well, like I said, this is actually one of the few times where sked yield actually works. But um, yeah, if you have two, well, if you're talking about inside the kernel, well, you're doing well. You shouldn't be inside the kernel. You don't want to do like sked. Um, uh, what's it called? setting priorities within the kernel is you're really a specific case, uh, which it, you may have. Uh, but so basically, you, if you have one that's doing an interrupt storm, you want to make sure the other one gets in. Yeah. But eventually, uh, even though it's doing an interrupt, oh, I guess because it just constantly runs, you can always have it lower its priority if it does so many. I mean, that's kind of like what uh, Linux does today with um, uh, soft IRQs. queues. Soft IRQ will come in if it starts doing too many soft IRQ uh, soft IRQs queues, because it does it in a soft IRQ context where interrupts can go on, but it preempts anything else. Um, once it starts doing too much, it will pass off the information to uh, KSoft IRQD. So it will throttle itself. That's more deterministic. Right now, you're just, I mean, like I said, it's the easy approach. Using Rel and Robin is the easy approach. Say, like, okay, I'm going to use SCEDRR because that way they have both of them at the same priority, and this guy will eventually get in. 
which makes sense, but that's kind of, to me, I think that's being easy, or, and, but still not deterministic. It's like, it's not for a real-time situation. You're just basically, you're trying to do bandwidth, kind of, with SketRR. Then why don't you just, why keep it, why is it a real-time test? Why don't you just use the um, SketOther, which would do the same thing? Okay, so you just have, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I said, if you're just doing it just for bandwidth, okay, I'll, I'll let you go with this RR if you want to be kind of, I would call that kind of lazy, just saying, just to let it go, and, uh, but it's no determinism there. That's why I'm, like, I worry about RR because there's no deterministic behavior there. Um, and if you, like I said, you have the issue where if two tasks go on the same CPU and another task, it's not going to be migration at all. You're not going to get full utilization of all, so there's not going to be a fairness among those tasks. Yeah. Yep. No, yeah, I'm saying, okay, it's, like I said, SketRR, there, you could use it, but there's other ways of doing it, which I think is uh, more deterministic. But I'll, I'll agree, I mean, if, if it works for you and it uh, doesn't break and you don't need the deterministic behavior, yes, you could use SketRR, but I wish we would get rid of it. Because people think it's sometimes think more of it than it, they should. So, yes. So we go over here. Why do I consider? Why do I consider scheduling domains not nice? This is why I don't like it. <laughs> do I have to explain? <laughs> No, 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 yeah, yeah. I'm just saying it's not easy to set up. And currently, and I shouldn't be saying this, but I'll say it, currently um, there's bugs in this, in the kernel, huge bugs. Uh, there's times where the accounting gets screwed up. So, and it's almost always on the worst. It's not like you, you're going, it's not, I've never seen it be where I got free utilization. No, I did once. <laughs> where the, I got more utilization, the kernel let me, get more utilization than actually I had. But then what happens is it gets screwed up sometimes where it, like you get lost or leakage, where utilization disappeared. And then when you go set everything up, it says, no, you don't have any bandwidth. And the only thing I had to do, I had to reboot the box because I had no idea what screwed up in there. I found out there was way, once I found the bug, I was able to get that bandwidth back, but that was a bug. And there's a lot of um, uh, complexity when you do SCED domains. And if you look inside the kernel, the SCED domains is code is, is not the most trivial of pieces of code in the kernel. And we're attaching you know, priorities and bandwidth and these complex calculations to all this. So we're working on it. Sked deadline's still in its infancy, so it's just, it's a, just born, you know, let it grow. It's going to have growing pains. And right now, we're working on that. Anything else? Why are you way back there? Do you have to scream? Um, yeah, you can. It's basically, it's a bandwidth scheduler. So if you just don't want this guy to run, so you could just have it throttle, let the CPU throttle it. So you want to give something only a percentage. Uh, for example, uh, what's a good use for the case for sched deadline, which I didn't bring up, I only have a minute, 40 seconds, but is uh, uh, guests, guests and hosts. So if you're doing a virtualization and you have a bunch of guests and you want to guarantee, you basically want to limit a guest to only maybe 20% of the CPU and other tests, so you could spread guests out and only give, like, so if a customer pays 20% of the utilization, someone else pays 50% of the utilization, you could use this sched deadline to only utilize the uh, CPU. Uh, and that's event triggered, so it wakes up, it only, when it runs, it only gets a percentage of the CPU while it's running, and then when it goes to sleep, like if it goes to sleep or whatever, so it can't be event driven if you're just controlling that. So that's actually one of the big use cases of it, which I should have brought up, but since I was doing this more from the real time aspect, that's um, what I was going for. But yes, uh, one of the things is the band, that's what the concept bandwidth scheduler is. Um, and media, multimedia is very big. So if you basically want to give like a TV or something where it needs a, a bandwidth, but it doesn't need all the 100% CPU, where it's um, basically frames are coming in, you could give it guaranteed frame packages thing. And a lot of the papers, if you look at it, talk about video, uh, what they use, uh, better use cases for how like G streaming and such. So you could, yep, a sporadic server uh, for, that's another implementation. I got, yes, so I got 14 seconds. Okay, so, so the, uh, I do not know the instance of TDK, but that could also be an application if you 
For which what? DPP, yeah, DPP, okay. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, my time is up. So um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.